Welcome to the We Grow Our Show with your hosts, Nick Klein and Don Cupper. We discuss everything from politics to planting. Live food storage is our passion, and we want to share our passion with you. We cover techniques, methods, and tips to not only survive, but thrive. Join us at WeGrowOurs.com and get your grow on. Today is episode number one of We Grow Ours. We're going to talk to Nick Klein. We're going to find out about rabbits. We're going to tell you a little bit about who we are, why we do this, and we're going to talk about aquaponics. Nick? I'll basically explain why you want to take Thumper, kill him, and eat him. <laughs> and that's exactly the same with aquaponics. We're not going to get into a lot of details today about how to do this stuff. We're going to talk more about the motivation behind it, why you may want to do it. Exactly. So enjoy the episode, our first episode. I hope you guys follow along. Go to the website, wegrowours.com. Ask us questions. We want you guys to engage with us. This week on We Grow Ours, we'll be discussing how we got started and what our goals are. And to put it simply, our goal is to make independent people. Uh, we want to turn sheep into wolves. So all you sheeple out there that aren't sure what to do, we will teach you how to be independent. Everything from growing your own food to producing your own electricity. We will be discussing tips on how to bug out, how to dig in if uh, you're into the prepping scene, and basic homesteading techniques to turn any home into a homestead. Yeah, we're going to actually teach people, not only the preppers, we, we want you guys to listen too. You're a big part of our core. Uh, but we want everybody out there who's interested in self-sustainability. We want to teach people how to feed their families in good times and in bad. So that's what We Grow Ours is about. On the website, you can go to the Ask Us button. You can post your question. You can actually record your voice and be featured on the podcast. That reminds me. You know, right now, uh, there's a, a few shows out there that really put a negative spin on the whole prepping movement. Uh, I want you guys to know that 90% of the people that come to the Survivalist Expos aren't your hardcore doomsday prepper in the, up in the White Mountains with the bunker. Uh, they're usually, uh, 90% of them are folks that are afraid that the political scene will turn south or uh, just losing their job in a down economy. Yeah, look at the dollar value. Look what the dollar value is doing. Exactly. I, I'm, not, I'm not a big doomsday prepper. What I'm a prepper for is in case I lose my job. I want my kids to eat. I want my wife to eat. I, I want my dogs to eat. Exactly. Exactly. It's, you know, it, this the prepping movement is just being in control of your situation, being prepared for that rainy day. No, we don't all believe that zombies will be scratching at the windows and at the top of the bunker. Well, they but, might be. You never but, know. Yeah. Well, I guess hungry people, you can call them zombies. Um, but uh, it's good to prepare for, oh, shoot, an earthquake in an un unseen location. You know, it's nice to just be ready for that rainy day. A absolutely. And and that's that's what we're here for. That's what We Grow Ours is for. That's why we're doing this podcast. We want you guys to be part of the show. We want... We want you to interact with us, and we want you to learn with us. That's right. Now, Don and I, we don't know everything, but uh, pretty dang close. So uh, when you guys have suggestions, hit up the website, record the questions, things that you want to learn about, and uh, we'll get people on the show that will teach those things, or we will research it ourselves. So, Nick, I'm going to – I want to interview you for our first episode. This is our, 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 our brand-new podcast. I want to know about you. I want to know about your background. I know that you're a mass murderer of the cute and fluffy. Self-proclaimed, yes. Okay. So tell me about uh, you. Tell me about Hostile Hair. Uh, Nick runs a company called Hostile Hair. Uh, tell us, why are you doing this and, and what is – who is Nick? Well, I am from the backwoods of Wisconsin. I'm a farm boy. I've raised on a dairy farm and a beef farm. You know, since I was old enough to walk, we were feeding calves and, and bucking hay and all that stuff. But uh, when I moved to Arizona, I purchased a home in a homeowners association where a Jersey cow or a Holstein cow uh, just wasn't going to fly. So I had uh, aspirations of growing my own food, and uh, so I started looking at uh, urban-friendly livestock. 
Uh, even chickens are outlawed in my HOA, so I went the quieter route and bought a couple of rabbits. Well, if anybody out there has done rabbits, you know that rabbit math is different from regular math, because in rabbit world, one plus one equals 64 babies a year. <laughs> so, uh, in no time flat, I had, I went from five rabbits to 15 breeding rabbits to 50 breeding females, I was producing about 250 babies a month. I had built the market in such a way that uh, I kept on going. I, I was selling out every month, so built a bigger facility, and now I've got uh, capabilities of uh, 1,600 head on my property at any given time. And that's in an HOA. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's what We Grow Ours is about. We're about live food storage. That's right. Integration of our systems. That's right. The idea is to produce a food that's not being fed genetically modified crap, uh, it's not being pumped full of antibiotics for quote unquote precautionary reasons. Uh, it's not being injected with hormones to get that extra growth spurt. And it's not being kept in inhumane conditions. I believe in being responsible carnivores. Yes, I like meat. No, I don't want the meat to be tortured before it hits my plate. So the only way that I can trust what I'm eating is if I grow it myself. Now, I understand that not everybody out there has got an acre to 200 acres to grow their own food. And so my goal at Hostel Hair was to teach people how to grow good, high-protein, good-quality meat in a very small environment. Uh, we've also branched into quail. And recently when I met Don, uh, we've integrated the quail, the rabbits, and now tilapia fish into a system that I call hair oponics, the hop. And uh, Don will tell you a little bit more about the aquaponics side of things. Yeah. So let me let me get into who I am, Don Cupper. I own Ecopod Gardens. Uh, met Nick over to one of these prepper expos, uh, survival fests. We started learning about rabbits. Uh, I've been growing, doing aquaponics for almost a decade now. I go out. I custom design systems for people. I teach people. Um, education is a key. And it's a key to grow an industry. It's a key for people to learn everything there is a, a, about self-sustainability. I learned that we live in a desert. I tried my hand at gardening. It didn't work. Um, <laughs> I got dirty. I was sitting on my knees. I couldn't grow anything. Uh, my wife actually went out and bought one of these little uh, – they had just come out too. It was a little uh, hydroponic setup. I think Miracle Grow owns them now, uh -huh. and an amazing little thing. And she said, "I want to grow more," so I got into hydroponics. Started spending a freaking fortune on nutrients for these plants. I said, "My God, I, I can't afford this. We're, we're putting more nutrients in than, than we're getting out in value. There's got to be a better way to this." That's when I found aquaponics. Somebody said, "Hey, you know, you can use fish on this." I got online. Uh, figured out real quick that on YouTube and on all these other media outlets, there's a lot of just as much misinformation as there is good information. Right. So I, I had to weed through that for a few years before I really figured out aquaponics. I got my hand in it, started experimenting, and now I share that with people. That's what I do, and, and that's when I met Nick. Is right after I started up a business, the hobby kind of went from going out to friends and families and helping them set up because they were excited about what I was doing. I said, I'm spending, you know, 40, 50 hours a week doing this. I think it's time to, to make a business out of it. Went to a prepper fest, bought a booth, had amazing reactions. I think we were one of the first hydro uh, aquaponic companies at these things. And I, I know it's the industry has grown, which is exactly what we need. So <laughs> I saw the rabbits. I said, there's got to be a way to integrate that. I can grow food for the rabbits. And Nick, you went one more and said, wait a minute, we can actually replace the fish or mm -hmm. utilize fish and rabbits as part of the system. That's right. It's funny because uh, that same uh, that same prepper expo that I met Don, uh, the guy that put it on, uh, I called him up and said, "Hey, I'd, I'd like to uh, I'd like to get a booth at your at your show you got coming up." He said, "Okay, what do you want to sell?" I, I want to bring rabbits, <laughs> and I I could hear the pause on the other end of the phone. He's like, "All right, so how do rabbits play into the prepper movement?" And uh, then I explained to him that in a very small space, I mean six foot by four foot, you can produce up to 5,700 pounds of rabbit a year. And that got the light bulb going and, and pretty soon I'm getting phone calls from him and a few other people that, that want the rabbits at the expos. It really, it really is, uh, you know, what Don and I do is a little bit unconventional because 
uh, everybody has this mindset of, oh, you buy canned goods, you put the cans on the shelf, and you eat them. And that's as far as it goes. So when that shelf runs out of canned food, whether they expire or you eat them, you have empty shelves. What Don and I do is we replace the shelves with live food storage systems. So that same amount of space that you would use to uh, build your pantry up so you have a, a limited amount of time to eat junk food, instead of that, you actually put your money into a reproducible food system. Yeah. Now, uh, and and another thing with these can the canned food, I, I think everybody should have some canned food on their shelves, but I know I am a budget prepper. And I can't afford AKA the space. He's cheap. I'm cheap. I am really <laughs> cheap. I gotta admit. So, you know, what, this is another way around that. I'm, we're constantly feeding our family. The, the return on investment is amazing. Mm-hmm. We've gotten it, uh, between Nick and I working together, we've gotten this down to what I call a net zero cost. That's our goal is to teach people how to get there. That's right. And it's not as hard as it would seem. We, we offer training and, and, uh, you know, we're actually, going to have a homesteading conference here coming up in April. So if you're listening to this after April of 2014, so sad, too bad. Uh, oh, but come on. We'll have more and more of them. We'll have more. Keep, just keep watching the website. We'll uh, we'll put on a few more. But uh, it, it's really something that I enjoy. It, it's cool to watch everybody in the crowd learn stuff that just was unthinkable, just completely out of the norm beforehand. That it's, it's cool to watch somebody honestly learn. Yeah, and 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 again, that's that's what that's what we're here for. This is our first episode. We want to introduce you guys not only to to us, but what our passion is. We want you to share in the knowledge of it, and we're going to not only talk about life, food storage, rabbits, aquaponics, quail. We're going to talk a little bit about politics. We're going to have a lot of guests on the show. We've got some pretty good guests lined up. Uh, once we get this out there and published, you're going to see them on our homepage. If you want to be a guest, you can contact us as well. And, of course, any listener can go to the Ask Us page, record their question, and we'll try to address those on the podcast. Yeah, and that's, you know, the we're going to be hitting a wide spectrum here. I mean, yeah, we've talked a lot about our background, and, and I have to admit it sounds a little bit like a sales pitch, but both Don and I are very excited about what we do. So uh, forgive us now if you think that we're kind of pitchy. Another thing that uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about that I don't have a business in is uh, my research into alternative fuels. I am a capitalist. And I am cheap and I am lazy, we'll just call it. So when you combine the, the three of those, those, uh, we'll call them qualities. I don't like being at the gas station paying a bunch of money. I don't like, uh, having to, uh, ride a bicycle to work because gas is too expensive. So I've been looking at alternatives and, and I've done everything from fermenting cellulose rich materials for methanol production to uh, electrolysis for hydrogen production. The latest and greatest thing that I really am getting behind is gasification, which is uh, the heating up of biomass to release hydrocarbons. And so we'll be covering that a little bit more in depth in episodes to come. But uh, that's just to give you guys an idea that this is not just a dog and pony show, if you will. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, we've, we've gotten into chickens. Uh, you know, I, I just added another dozen... 13 actually chickens. So I guess that's a farmer's dozen, right? A baker's dozen. Baker's dozen. dozen, So I had another baker's dozen. Unfortunately, we get a lot more eggs than that per day. So we're up to about 25 chickens. Um, We're actually selling some eggs out of our backyard now. My wife is passionate about that. And the reason I bring that up is that's another topic we're going to be discussing. Uh, Backyard chickens uh, along with, with ducks, with goats, the healthiness that goes with raising your own food. Uh, mm-hmm. The meat production that you can get not only out of rabbits but out of chickens. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, – I don't know if you guys have seen the news recently, but almost all the chicken out there in the grocery store is filled with uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. I mean, come on. You, you, you can't keep eating this stuff. It's not sustainable. Yep. I mean, eventually, you're just going to be buying uh, Petri dishes out there in the grocery store. You know, If you're buying – Here's here's something for you. The amount of time it takes fresh, quote unquote, fresh chicken to get to the grocery store is about a week and a half from the butchering facility. So it is packaged and it is in this little styrofoam container and cellophane wrapped, shipped on a truck, gets to the store and sits there. 
in that time, uh, when, if anybody out there has ever butchered a chicken and then eaten it that same day, you know that it's a little bit tough. The reason it's a little bit tough is because rigor mortis sets in. And that rigor mortis sets in and it makes it really chewy. Now, you don't get that with the fresh chicken at the store. Reason being is the bacteria has broke it down enough that it is now tender. Um, You've heard of aged beef, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, who out there likes USDA aged beef? Hey, I'm a big fan. Oh, it's good stuff. Well, the reason it's called aged beef is because – um Rotten bacteria ridden beef is not exactly a selling point. It's kept at 43 degrees and allowed to break down for a, a, an amount of time. I'm not sure the exact amount of time, but basically it's allowed to break down via bacteria, uh, for a certain amount of time and then they sell it. So it's tender. It's delicious, but you better cook it because I don't want my chickens <laughs> treated like that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the chickens that uh, have got salmonella and E. coli strands that are resistant to antibiotics, uh, it's not exactly, you know, I'm not trying to scare folks. I mean, if you cook it, you're, you'll kill it. Yeah, that that's the solution is to cook your chicken. Well, yeah. there's some other solutions too. Yeah, uh, you could grow your own. You grow your own. Um, you look at the, the pasture-raised chickens and, and what the FDA allows to call natural I mean, natural chicken, 40,000 chickens in this little tiny spot eating the dead chickens, eating their feces, you yeah. know, running around. That's, that sounds natural to me. So, <laughs> and you, you, I know you guys can't see us. You have to go to the website at wegrowers.com. Go take a look at a picture of Nick and I. We're, we're not the epitome of fitness by any means. <laughs> you know, we, in fact, I'm I, fluffy. Okay. Give it a break. Yeah. I think Nick's drinking a Mountain Dew. I got my Reese's sticks. So, you know, <laughs> we, we do this and, and we want to live a different lifestyle. We're not, uh, I don't know, what, what are they, granola? Granola nuts? Yeah, something like that. So. We don't want to be offensive or anything. Right, right. <laughs> well, a little bit is alright. <laughs> so yeah, we will be covering all of those th- topics and more. Yeah, absolutely. The website, wegrowours.com. That's right. Wegrowours.com. Get on there. Give us some suggestions. Ask uh, us. Follow us on Facebook. Do all that fun stuff. The more people we can get on board, the better. You know, we're going to be sharing our knowledge with you. We're going to be learning with you along the way uh, as we have these guests on. We're going to just, we're here to have fun. We want to share this with everybody out there and we want you guys to have fun and enjoy it too. So, so Nick's going to talk to us a bit about rabbits, about the numbers behind rabbits, almost a, an intro to rabbit class today as part of our first episode. Then I'm going to come back on. We're going to talk to you guys about aquaponics and kind of what we do just to give you a little bit more in-depth background. So, Nick, give me some information. Give me some numbers. Tell me why I want to raise rabbits. Tell me why it's so fun. Tell me your experience with it, and we'll go from there. All right. So you're probably asking why should I kill cute and fluffy thumper? Reason being, number one, delicious Rabbit meat, for those of you who haven't had it, is awesome. Uh, it's got the consistency of – it's kind of like biting into pork, but it has a really rich chicken-type flavor. And especially when it's you know farm-raised, uh, if anybody's been out hunting cottontail and fries up cottontail and thinks it's going to taste the same, you are so wrong. Now, I'm from Wisconsin, and in Wisconsin, the cottontails are eaten better than they are here in Arizona – but there's still no comparison to farm-raised rabbit. I am uh, a major fan of that, and not only because it tastes good, but it's 21% protein. So 21% protein means that you would only need to eat 215 pounds of rabbit a year, and you'd have all the protein covered for the year. Now, obviously, you don't want to just sit down and hork in 215 pounds, but when you divide that out, over uh, the course of the year, it's less than a pound a day to get all your protein in. So that's one reason. The other is it is very low in fat. It is also uh, very efficient. Like I had mentioned before, I'm actually uh, – I, I live in a homeowners association where chickens and beef and pork cannot be raised on the premises. Uh, they're too loud. They're too gross. But rabbits are nice and quiet and they don't need a whole lot of space. Rabbits, uh, they tend to want to stay out of sight and out of mind, and they feel better when they are close to other rabbits. So they make the perfect type of uh, 
of livestock because they don't require a whole lot of space. They'd rather be inside of a building or under a under a low shelf, and that way they don't have to worry about hawks from above or coyotes or any sort of predators. So they do very well in in a, in a small environment. Uh, they're very efficient on feed as well. My dad, he is a he's a beef farmer, and he uh, did the math for me and told me how much how much feed uh, cattle need in order to produce a, a fifteen hundred pound steer. And I don't have the numbers memorized and right in front of me, but when I compared it to how much it costs per pound in feed for rabbits. For every one pound of beef you can produce, I can produce six pounds of rabbit off the same amount of feed. So they are six times more efficient than beef, about two and a half times more efficient than, than chickens. So they're definitely, they're definitely the way to go, uh, on efficiency. So I, I've got a question. You, okay. you talked about that. I will put that in the show notes too. We'll go ahead and link out to the efficiencies if we can find that online. That way you guys can kind of take a look at the difference between the rabbit and beef. Yeah, definitely. Another reason that uh, rabbits are great is uh, their manure is the perfect fertilizer. It does not need to be composted. It is almost 100% nitrate. So if you know the difference between ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate, you know that nitrates are uh, plant friendly. So you're getting into aquaponics now. I thought you were talking about rabbits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I like rabbits because there's two ways to apply the manure. You could take them in their little pebble form and throw them on the garden as a time release nitrogen pellet. Or, is, is that like chicken? We use chickens, but I know we can't just throw that down because we yeah, end up with problems. That's right. You have to compost the chicken manure because it uh, it's full of ammonia and nitrites because they they urinate out the same orifice as what they poop out of. So everything's very, all well, very well said. Nick. Yeah, well, the, the poop and the pee come out the same hole. Anyway, but if you have a very uh, a very depleted soil, you can grind the rabbit manure up and make it more available for the plants because it, rabbit manure by itself sitting out in the open will maintain its form for up to three years. Uh, that's in the elements, that's in the sunshine and everything else. So anyway, the poop is good on rabbits. So uh, that's actually one of the reasons I got into rabbits is because I was looking to pelletize unorganized biomass to make fuel for a gasifier. And we'll, we'll, we'll cover that at another time. But... Uh, yeah, I was able to to replace one gallon of gasoline with eleven pounds of rabbit manure in BTU value. And and rabbits produce a lot of manure. Oh yeah, about three ounces by weight per day on nice. average. So uh, man, that's a long discussion about poop. Anyway, so rabbits, if you let's see, so you need two hundred and fifteen pounds of rabbit meat per year in order to get all the protein you need. Uh, it's kind of interesting that an adult female rabbit will produce 64 babies a year. She does that with eight kindles or litters per year, averaging eight babies per kindle. That gives you 64 babies. Now, it'll take them eight weeks to get up to about five pounds. So that's 320 pounds of live rabbit. When you dress that out, you get about 215 pounds of rabbit meat at 21% protein, which gives you all of the protein you need per so, year. So we're looking at one doe uh-huh. breeding on a, a a good schedule. Yep. Every 45 days, she'll be kicking out another another uh, set of babies. And that's the protein that uh, an adult human mm-hmm. needs to survive. That's right. So, so a family of three. We're talking about three does. Mm-hmm. So, which is actually pretty easy. That's, that's what I do at our house. Yeah. Rule of thumb is, uh, is one breeding female per member of the household. If you've got alternative, uh, meat sources, I still say rule of thumb, one breeding female per member of the household. You just back off the breeding schedule a little bit so you don't have as much rabbit meat being produced. But your threshold would still be that 215 pounds a year. Nice, very nice. Yeah, it, it it just makes sense. It makes mathematical sense. Now let's get. Tell me about what it costs 
to feed these. Now, I'm not talking about fodder systems and everything else. No, we'll just, I, I, I started out by going to the grocery, well, going to the to pet club store. down the road, the feed store, mm-hmm. and, you know, throwing that out there and, and grabbing some pelletized feed when it was a 16, 18 mm-hmm. percent. Tell me what it takes to feed these things and what my investment in this meat is on a per rabbit or per pound or per year basis. All right. So you figure you're feeding the adults four ounces a day by weight. And that's about six ounces by volume, about the size of a tuna can. And when you're using those measurements, there are 200 servings in a 50 pound bag of pelletized food. With that math, each breeding female will cost you just under $30 a year to feed herself. That means that those 64 babies up until the point where they are weaned only cost you 46 cents a piece. Now, Every additional pound that they put on after that costs you in feed. Uh, it costs you uh, four ounces a day per uh, per baby, which ends up being a five pound rabbit will end up costing you seventy five or excuse me seventy eight cents a pound if the feed bag costs you fifteen dollars. So, so you're telling me less than a dollar a pound? Yeah. Oh, much less. No, yeah. wait a minute. I go to AJ's and I saw a rabbit there the other day, and it was ten dollars a pound. That, sir, is called markup. <laughs> so I also noticed that most of the rabbit around here, you know, we, we live in Phoenix, but most of the rabbits around here come from Australia. That's right. They're shipping in these frozen shoe leather looking rabbits from Australia, China, New Zealand. Uh, reason being is in the United States, if you butcher rabbits here, it has to be a USDA voluntary inspection. Uh, not to get into the details, but basically that means money, 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 money. So, you know what? On uh, We Grow Ours, we do a random plug of the week. And I just think I came up with our random plug of the week. Brathaas in Scottsdale. Have you eaten there? Oh, I've, I've yet to do it. I've... Rabbit sausage. Rabbit sausage. Rabbit sausage at Brathaas in Scottsdale, downtown mm. Old Town. I love the place. Go in, order some some sausage, rabbit sausage. You get a good feel for what it tastes like. You know, it's obviously it's seasoned a little bit. So our random plug of the week this week for episode one, Broadhaas. How's that sound? Broadhaas. Okay. Everybody that's in Scottsdale or in the Phoenix area, go to Broadhaas and, and uh, tell us what you think. Yeah, and order it, the rabbit too and tell them they should be buying it from somebody local. Where was I? So, was... yeah, back to the numbers on the feeding costs, you know, um, what other health benefits do you see with these, with the rabbits? Well, for those that are trying to watch their cholesterol, their rabbits will give you all the protein you need without the added fats that you'd get from pork and beef and also chicken. It's got chicken beef because I believe chicken is still like uh, 20% protein, a little less, like 19 to 20%. Uh, so rabbits got the chicken beef too. So what about this rabbit starvation I hear about? Isn't that an issue? Let me explain that. It's actually called protein poisoning, and you can get that from eating nothing but spinach as well. You can get protein poisoning whenever your protein intake is uh, off the charts and you don't have anything else in your system that can dilute it a little bit. If you ate nothing but T-bone steak, you would die. A T-bone steak has enough fat in it. I think you'd die anyway if you just yeah, ate T-bone. We, it's, well, it's, it's nutritionally unsound to eat nothing but one thing. Right. If you ate chicken McNuggets – your whole uh, life, you'd probably die at age 20. So you're telling me it's really a non-issue? It's not because all you have to do is eat some baked potatoes alongside your rabbit and you'll never have an issue. You only need one breeding male for every 16 female females that you have. So that's that's about his limit. He will go to bed tired and happy every night, but he will get the job done for up to 16 females. Now, if you want to preserve genetics, you're going to want to – I would say the minimum – uh, starting off would be two breeding bucks and three breeding females. That way you can have five blood sources and five genetic lines and that'll keep you going for multiple generations. Yeah. And one of the ways I got around that, Nick, and I don't know if I've told you this yet. Um, my brother in law and my sister live right down the road from me. So what we did is they got into rabbits mostly because their little girl wanted to and she <laughs> likes them for pets, but they quickly found out they breed. So. <laughs> What we're doing now is I've got three does and a male. They've got three, probably eight by the time this oh. podcast goes out. Cause I know <laughs> they had seven babies. Uh, they had two does had seven babies just last week. So, um, but they started out with three. So we actually just kind of swap around and that way 
you know, I've got a male if I need it, they've got a male if they need it, and we can keep that that bloodline going without having a whole lot more. So that's something else. I mean, a lot of preppers, a lot of people out there, you want to talk about getting involved in your community, teaching people about rabbits, um, teaching people about growing their own food. This has to be a community thing. I know I feel that we don't, if we don't teach the community, they're going to come to us and rob from us for the most part. So by getting out there and giving a hand, teach your neighbors rabbits. Now you've got more bloodlines out there. So it's, it's another way around that. Definitely. Definitely. I, I love that. The, the, for all of the preppers out there, those of you that are buying gold and hoping that people will want gold when the world's going to crap, uh, gold will starve you. <laughs> you can't eat it. So, I would stock up on ways to provide for my family sustenance. Rabbits are a good way to go. They're like your own personal post-apocalyptic money printing press because they continuously breed. Uh, you just, you can forage for the rabbits. You don't have to stockpile feed. You can stockpile seeds that then become feed. That's actually a much more efficient way of, of raising rabbits is growing the, the seeds out, uh, in order to feed grass or what they call fodder to the bunnies. Now, we do uh, classes as well, and I know one of the things we talk about are the keys to integration. So you can use the rabbit poop to actually get fish food. I'm in aquaponics. That's that's my passion. I do the rabbits as a as a secondary protein source, but there are a lot of integration techniques that can be used with rabbits, with aquaponics, with quail, and those rabbits can actually provide protein not based off of the meat, but based off of their poop using larva and, and other things that you can actually feed right to your fish and quail. So, I mean, you talk about a survival or a prepper, this is definitely something that they, they'll want to look into. That's right. I mean, with rabbit manure being a, a warm fertilizer and also it's, it's very high in protein. Not that you want to, uh, you feed, basically you feed the, uh, the manure into a composter. And, uh, like Don was saying, there's a breed of flies called the black soldier fly. And I'll let him explain that a little bit more in depth. But, uh, basically for every five pounds of, of refuse you put into a composter that has black soldier flies, you get out a pound of black soldier flies. Am I right on that one? Yeah, that's very close. You know what? We'll go ahead and put a link up. In fact, I'm not going to get into black soldier flies on episode number one <laughs> because one of our upcoming guests is going to – he's the expert in black soldier flies. Ooh. We're going to have the manufacturer of one of the largest black soldier flies uh, containers or harvesting pieces of equipment um, is going to come on the show and they're going to teach us all about black soldier flies. So I'm actually going to hold off on that one. I'm going to refer to the expert. And we're going to let him come in and and talk to us. So uh, I don't know if that'll be an episode two or three, but you can definitely look at the show notes for that, and we will we will uh, point you in that direction. So awesome. Well, just know for now that the the BSF larva is just a great thing for integrating your uh, your rabbits into an aquaponic system, and even for creating chicken feed. So yeah, be ready for that one. So next up, we're going to talk a little bit about aquaponics. And Don, this is definitely your ball field. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, aquaponics is a passion of mine. I, I, I've been doing it for, I think I said before, about a decade now. A little less, probably eight, nine years. Kind of lost track there for a while. Owned a business for only about a year now. But it's been a hobby and a passion. So uh, led me to here, led me to We Grow Ours done a lot with livestock integration lately and I'm excited about it. I'm excited to share the knowledge. So aquaponics, most people at this point have heard of aquaponics. Aquaponics in its basic form is using fish to grow plants. Actually, more precisely fish waste. So we need the fish to produce the waste. We then harvest the fish for the food um, and then grow plants. Okay, so the the fish manure and ammonia go straight to the plants. The plants absorb it, make food for you. I wish it was quite that easy, but it's not. Actually, the fish produce the ammonia, which okay. then turns into nitrites and nitrates, which then the plants eat. So we need some anotrophic bacteria. We need Anna some what? Anna what? Yeah. <laughs> so we need those little bacteria to come in, and they feed off of ammonia. Um, one of the starting points with aquaponics that most people don't talk about is the cycling process. 
cycling process is actually about nine weeks. Uh, it takes about nine weeks, and we generally cycle without fish. We do fishless cycling. We use uh, kits that we have to do that and add ammonia to the water before we add the fish. That brings in the bacteria without poisoning the fish, allows them to break that down, and then another bacteria comes in and, and breaks so, their ways down to plant food. So you're saying you're... Your first nine week cycle, you're actually using outside ammonia. Correct. You put that in there and that will, uh, provide food for your first set of bacteria. First and second set. Okay. So after the nine week period, what we're looking for is a lot of nitrates. So that, that's what the plants eat. That's what we want here. Okay. That's, that's interesting. I, you know, from, from, uh, layman's terms, when you have a fish tank, and you have nitrates and nitrites building up in the fish tank, your fish die. And I guess that would be a good reason not to have fish in it in the first nine weeks when you're trying to build those things up. Right. So once that cycle process is complete, then we'll generally add the fish to keep the ammonia going, which the bacteria then consume, and it doesn't go back to the fish. So there's a lot of different types of aquaponics. There's deep water culture. Mm -hmm. There's NFT, nutrient film technique. There is media-based which is generally what we have people start out with. And then there's hybrids, which is kind of a combination of the two. You can get into vertical aquaponics, great for strawberries, blackberries, different types of berries. And we, uh, we grow pretty much any type of plant you can imagine in the aquaponic systems. And we then incorporate wicking beds for most of our root based vegetables, potatoes, carrots, you know, any kind beets. of beets. I, I'm not a beet eater, so. But you certainly can. Kale, we do kale in our floating raft systems, which is a deep water culture. Uh, kale, lettuce, uh, a lot of the butter crunch lettuce that, that my kids love, we will grow that in there. Basil, we'll grow in a deep water culture system. And by combining all of the methods, you can really expand and grow that system. So aquaponics is simple, yet it can be difficult. It can be frustrating. One of the things that uh, doing this for, for a number of years now I found is a lot of people get into aquaponics and they last six months, maybe a year, and then they get frustrated and they leave aquaponics and they, they think, oh, that was too hard. Well, I went through that too. I found that the misinformation out there is there's as much of that as there is good information. So we're going to try and share with you today some of the good information. One of the main stumbling blocks for people when they first start aquaponics is the type of media that they choose. So I've gone out and done some consultations and somebody, I have a beautiful aquaponic system sitting there and they can't get it to grow anything and their fish are constantly dying. Well, a lot of times that's due to pH. We go and look at their pH and they're constantly fighting the pH. In a healthy aquaponic system, your pH actually won't change that much and it's very, very, uh, uncommon to have to, to go in. It'll it'll lower over time. So you're actually generally just going to have to raise your pH a little bit, but it's not going to, you know, shoot around. Uh, I see a lot of people battling with pH levels in the nines and uh, even higher sometimes. That's a big stumbling block for people to start. And we start looking and we say, well, where did you get your, your media here? It's gravel. Oh, we got it at the local quarry. We got it at the local rock shop. And turns out that in that is a bunch of limestone. Uh, that's pretty common here in Arizona. And that's been wreaking havoc on the system. They, they're ready to give up. The problem is when they, when they start introducing limestones and, and other foreign type objects that are not inert, uh, the pH levels will go all over the place and it's really tough to balance. So. Well, here in Arizona, it's going to be hard to find any local source of, of grow media then because our pH is naturally very high in the well, soil here. Yeah, in the soil, but uh, a lot of the – you can do it. You just need to test. You're going to use vinegar and some other things. There's ways to test the pH. What I tell people to do is take a gallon of water and add your media to it. Test your pH before you put it in. After a day or two, test it again. Has it changed dramatically? If it has, you've got some type of contamination, whether the pH goes way up or way down. Don't use that type of gravel. So go to the store, uh, go to your gravel source, get a handful of it, a Ziploc baggie of it before you spend the money and the time to shovel 500 pounds of media into your system. And, and you're going to get frustrated. So, Which is not easily removed, I might add. No, you, you pretty much have to replace it. One of the things that we tell people is, one of the most expensive items to buy is good media. Uh, we recommend expanded clay pebbles. 
there's a lot of people out there and you can use a lot of different things. Um, expanded clay media is inert. You're not going to have any of the pH issues. It's not going to hurt your hands when it comes time to maintenance. So we highly recommend that people start out with that. And the money that they're going to spend there is going to save them the money and the frustration in the long run. So that's, that's one of the things that we, we kind of get people started with. Now I, I played around a little bit with, uh, with aquaponics and, uh, I had a grow bed that I built. It looked like a redneck catastrophe in my backyard. And, uh, I used pea gravel and, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but when it came time to maintain that pea gravel, it was heavy, it was gross, it was not what I was after. Yeah, pea gravel is actually a little small too. Um, oh, you can, really? Yeah, you can have problems uh, with water retention and other issues with pea gravel because it's so tiny. That might have explained the smell. Okay. If you've got a bad smell in your aquaponic system, something is wrong. Um, I can actually walk out in my greenhouse and take a sniff. And I know exactly what's going on with my water. I've been doing this for a long time and, and people are saying, well, I, how did you know you needed to raise the pH or lower it or something's wrong? Well, you can smell. If you smell something rotting, you've got problems. You've got dead zones in there. And a lot of times that has uh, ramifications of the media that you've chosen, whether it's too small or too large. If it's too large, you're not going to get the filtering that you need. So we're talking about media-based aquaponics right now. Okay. Now, if you go into the deep water culture, uh, one of the things out there, even with the hybrid systems, you really need to filter your water. And you need to filter it a lot. You need to get almost all of those suspended solids out of that water. And suspended solids, I mean fish poop. You need to get them out of the water. And otherwise, they're going to clog up your roots. You might get a year out of it, but at that point, uh, you're not going to see the production that you did unless you spend a lot of time and a lot of maintenance on it. So aquaponics, one of the points of it is that at least here in Arizona, in, in, in my opinion, we live in a desert. Aquaponics uses 90% less water than traditional gardening because we're not watering the ground. We're keeping a closed-loop system. So what is the point of dumping out three, 400 gallons of water every month on the ground and not utilizing that, not keeping that in your system because you're not filtering right and your plants won't grow right at that point? In Arizona, we have a... a very hard water. Anybody that's lived here knows that. Um, if you have a soft water in different parts of the countries, you may not have this problem. But out here, you know, we recommend a 10% water change per month. And by doing that, we're using wicking beds. So we're getting our water change done right there. And we're putting filtering on our even city water to get the chlorine out. We're degassing it. And we're filtering for calcium, magnesiums, um, any kind of hard uh, mineral substance in that water. And you're right, we have a very high pH water at that point. Mm -hmm. That actually lends itself well to aquaponics in Arizona because the system is naturally going to lower. So by adding that water, by doing that change, a lot of times we don't need to add those chemicals in there to bring that pH up. The water will do that naturally. So the here's a question for you. Um, the ammonia in the water, let's say you just added ammonia uh, just for argument's sake. Will the pH go down or up with ammonia? pH shouldn't change with ammonia. Okay. So it's not a, it's, it's a neutral then. Yeah. And you shouldn't have ammonia in our aquaponic system unless you're cycling in the first place. Okay. Uh, we want to keep the pH somewhere between 7 and 7.5. Um, don't let it go over 7.5. Don't let it drop below maybe 6.5. A lot of people try to keep it exactly at 7. I, I don't subscribe to that philosophy. I'm not one that goes out there and tests my water every day after the cycling process either. We want to go out there and test our water once a week and we want to know, you know, if we need to raise or lower, but I'll let the system do its thing naturally. Plants aren't going to mine 6.5. It's not ideal. 7, 7.2 is. As you get up into the higher, you might want to bring it down. But again, a system should naturally lower the pH and by adding water that's a little bit higher, we're going to pretty much balance that without having to do much. Awesome. So getting started, uh, let's say I've got my wife and three kids, so there's five of us. What uh, what do I need to do to feed my family of five? Well, uh, you need to grow other things as well. You need to have other animals. If you're looking to be sustainable, off-the-grid type living, um, aquaponics can do that. However, it's going to require a large system and a fairly substantial investment. So 
That's one of the first things we do. I, I don't really sell a whole lot of kits per se. We resell aquaponic systems for a few different suppliers. We mostly do custom work. In fact, everything that goes out our, our door, even the kits, is custom. And the reason we do that is we want to know what your goals are. Mm-hmm. So a family of five for you, you might only eat certain types of fruits and vegetables, in which case a smaller system will supplement that for you. But it's not going to feed you full time. You're going to need something else along with that. Your wife may not like fish. So you may not want she to even. She actually doesn't like fish. So yeah. That's... Yeah. You may not even want to harvest your fish. You may say, I want to try a different kind of fish. Now bartering, that oh, works yeah. out well with aquaponics too. We barter a lot of our foods for meats and our fresh vegetables and things like that that we don't eat. We might grow something and we taste it. I don't like, I hate Brussels sprouts, you know, so I won't. Now, if I do grow them, we barter them out for other foods. Interesting. Yeah. So size wise, it really depends on the, on your family's needs, on what you want to do. If you want to grow lettuce, you don't need a big system. If that's only going to supplement your salads, that's fine. Most people start with IBC containers or fish tanks around 300 gallons, which is going to give you about 30 fish, about 110 pounds of tilapia per year. So it's a pretty decent amount. And when you pair that with other sustainable methods, such as, uh, you know, raising rabbits, raising quail, integrating black soldier flies, you know, any, any of that stuff, you can really change the dynamics of, of your household. That's what we've done. We've actually, you know, I used to live in an HOA. I moved out to the desert a little bit further and lucky. Yeah. We now homeschool too. And, you know, my kids go out and they take care of the animals. They take care of the aquaponic systems. They help me harvest. That's that's what we do, do as a family, as part of their education. We still go to the grocery store. Uh, we don't eat fully off of aquaponics. You know, some people can. And again, it, it's really dependent on your goals. So you're going to need a larger system to answer your question. If you want to feed your family sustainable off of a full thing, you're going to want something that most people don't want in their backyard. So I think it's it's important to educate people that, about that because that's the other failure I see is people will go out and say, well, I wanted to feed my family and I got an IBC tote and I cut it in half and I flipped the top over and, you know, all I'm doing is growing two, you know, tomato plants and a couple of pieces of lettuce and it's not enough to feed us. Well, no, it's not. You can't live off of that. You um, have to have some realistic expectations. That's right. You've got and to get that. comes with education. Absolutely. And, and that's why we do the, we do a lot of free classes actually. Uh, uh, we grow ours. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nick and I actually go out and we, we teach free classes to educate people to get their, their, expectations and check as to what aquaponics can do for you, what quail can do for you. So that's a big part of the industry is teaching people what they can do with it, what their expectations should be. Yeah, I I, I really want to focus on that. Uh, you know, it, if you set a goal and you have an unrealistic goal, it's going to be very hard to attain. So in my little backyard, I've got 50 foot by 20 foot and I want to be able to feed my family out of there. Well, if all I have are a couple of grow beds and some float rafts and a 300-gallon tank, chances are I'm not going to be able to produce enough food for my family. If you don't, you know, you, you want to be able to save money by getting into this and not waste money by getting into it and failing at it. So again, I got to stress, this is, this is something that you don't just look up a YouTube video, look at a system that's already built and then try to hodgepodge and replicate it. Right. Uh, Even the kits that are out there that you can buy, you know, people are met with some mixed success on some of those. I'm hoping we can get a couple of manufacturers on the the podcast and we'll talk to them and and talk about the pluses and minuses, you know, what they say their expectations for their kits should be because it's a big misunderstanding in the industry as to what aquaponics, you know, it's a miracle. I, I absolutely am in love with aquaponics. It's one of my passions. So I want everybody to do it, but I want everybody to do it right. My philosophy and part of the reason that I do this is not only to feed my family and be prepared. You know, if I, God forbid, lose my job, something happens, I, I were to be disabled, my, my wife and kids can keep that going. But there's more to it as far as feeding my neighbors and not just feeding them, but teaching them. Mm-hmm. If I can teach them how to garden um, using aquaponics, if I can teach them how to garden, if I can get them to grow something, raise some, some of their own food, whether it's in an apartment, whether it is in, you know, a couple of acres, whether it's in a single car garage, I think we're better off. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we're out here to do. We're out here to educate the community. 
about everything, live food storage, prepping without canned foods. Yep. I mean, well, you, like you said earlier, it's, it's good to have canned foods. It's good to have a three month to a year supply of canned foods. That way you can step up your production to, to basically take over your canned foods once they are either expired or, or used up. Uh, you want to be able to have a buffer of time where you can survive until your micro farm or urban farm is taking off and then you can thrive. That's right. In aquaponics, we talked about that nine week cycle process. That's mm-hmm. to get started. It's about nine months to see that system to maturity where you're going to really see that growth take off. We're getting 10 times the yield as traditional gardenings. You can plant things a lot closer together. It, it's hard to do uh, without pictures, so I'll probably post a couple pictures up as well. But if you envision taking a hose and watering the ground, all the water seeps down. And when it does that, the roots have to go find it, and they have to find their nutrients. In mm-hmm. aquaponics, we're using – It's basically hand-delivered to the plants. It, it's hand-delivered to the plants, and it's it's neat because if you pull a plant up that's been sitting in your aquaponics system, you're going to see that the the root is almost a ball. It's more of a ball than what you'll find out in the garden. Um, I was amazed at that. I, I pull a pepper plant up and – and, you know, there's this big ball and it really doesn't spread out as much as you would think it would for the size plant. That's because the nutrients are being brought right to it. And in an ebb and flow system, mm-hmm. which is a very common method out there is to fill the grow bed and then drain the grow bed using a bell siphon or timers or something. When that water drains, it's actually pulling in oxygen. So it's a breathing system. So you you end up bringing everything you need to that plant. You're bringing it the oxygen. You're bringing it the nutrients. You're bringing it the water. It doesn't have to go in search of it. So I'm not a botanist. I don't know a whole lot about plants. And what I do know, though, is I, I think that's part of the reason you get such a yield out of it is you're not growing all these roots. You're growing up. You're getting fruit out of these things. Yeah, the less leaves and the less offshoots it has to produce, the more energy is going into producing the fruit. Absolutely. You start talking about the results that you get in aquaponics and and that's it's amazing. My favorite part of the aquaponics is well, for one, the reason my gardens, conventional gardens have failed is uh Nick gets a little bit lazy and uh it's like, "Oh, I'll water it tomorrow." Well, tomorrow yeah. tomorrow comes and it gets baked and we are in Arizona, so it doesn't take long for a tomato plant to die um in in this heat without water. And with aquaponics, you've got a built-in timer that's constantly feeding it water. And you don't have to think about it near as much. That's right. I'm sitting here nodding my head. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, everything Radio is in nod. there. And, uh-huh. <laughs> that's right. One of the uh, the other cool things is there's no weeding. Oh uh, yeah. I I just could not do the the weeding involved in it. The the sitting on my knees. Um, yeah, that's uh, the other plus is aquaponics. It set it a nice what three foot off the ground. Yeah, it's wherever around. you want it off the ground. Yeah, you could set it at countertop height. And you're sitting there working where your back's not bent over, you're not kneeling, you're walking around. It's it's fun to garden. It's not, holy cow, I've got another blister from this stupid hoe that I've been pulling through and tilling up my earth. Uh, it's, oh, I'd like a tomato. Done. Yep. Well, and, you know, my mom is actually um, in a scooter. Okay. So she's got a bad ankle. She's in a scooter and... The aquaponic system that we put in at my sister's house, she lives in the little guest house, put it right next to her house at, at their house, and she can go out and drive her scooter around and pick them. There is no way she could get on the ground and do these gardenings. It just wouldn't happen. And my sister herself has been in, was in an accident. Um, she broke a, a lot of bones and hips, hip problems, and she has this thing with countertop height where if she's bent over the countertop, she's in a lot of pain. So we actually lowered it just a little bit. And she can actually now go out and garden. They had a soil garden. They spent a lot of money on that soil garden too. Just to bring the soil in, they're spending, you want to compare pricing on it. And yeah, it's probably a little bit less, but by the time you truck in soil to fill even 30 square feet, you're talking about some serious money. I think they put 1800 2000 into this garden with the, the fertilizer and the nutrients oh. and the soil and the railroad ties and, you know, setting this whole thing up. It doesn't take long to spend that kind of jack. Yeah, and with aquaponics, you know, um, yeah, you're going to spend some money up front. If you want to, you can also free source. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I know people that do this in bathtubs, 55-gallon drums that they go find. Uh, my, my word of caution on doing that is if you're going to go get free stuff, 
make sure you know what was in it. You know, using an IBC or an international bulk container, they're absolutely wonderful for aquaponics, but you really don't want one that had Roundup in it. <laughs> you know, um, kind of counterproductive. Yeah, and you, we talk about those pH problems. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, you'll find somebody. Oh well, it was you know gasoline or oil or something in there. It's messing up that pH and it's it's causing problems with the system. So make sure it's food safe if you're using plastic, the blue plastic tubs, the IBC containers. Plus, bath, bathtubs work well. So what I got from that last segment is uh, Don's mother is in a, in a scooter. His sister is uh, is hurting from a car accident, and he still makes them garden. What a punk. What now, a wait horrible, a minute. They, they horrible go, son. They go out and they pick. <laughs> All right. So let, that actually brings up the maintenance. How much maintenance is there on an aquaponics system? She has a wonderful husband. I know he's going to be a guest on the podcast because he's already asking me. So – uh, he goes out and he does most of the maintenance on this, but the maintenance is a couple minutes a day. In fact, most of the maintenance is picking your fruits. That's he, not maintenance. That's eating. I yeah, like, that's right. I like that maintenance. There is no weeding. So we're testing our water once a week. We're checking our water levels daily. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure that the system has water and you don't want your pumps to run dry. And the biggest maintenance there is in aquaponics is we feed our fish twice a day. Okay. Yeah. Now here's here's a question. You, you're talking about feeding the fish. If it's my understanding that uh, the well, for example, the the Salt River Project um, SRP here in in the valley, they used tilapia 30 years ago for cleaning the algae off of the canals. There's a major algae increase since we have nothing but sunshine in Arizona, and a bunch of troughs filled full of water is kind of inviting for algae. Uh, and it was clogging everything up. So they bought these fish, they turned them loose in there, and they're growing massive tilapia just off of the algae that grows. So is it possible to raise algae to feed your fish? Uh, you, a lot of people raise duckweed, which isn't really algae, but it's a, it's a small micro plant. Okay. Um, amazingly high in protein. You can use it's it. It's like 40% to, if I remember. Yeah, 40% right. protein. You can use it to feed your fish. You can also use it to feed your ducks, your chickens, your quail. Hence the name duckweed. Duckweed. Okay. Uh, so it's got a multi-purpose. Uh, one of the things that you can do with the algae is you can actually harvest the algae to make biofuels. That's true. It's very high in lipids. Uh, in fact, some of the lipids that, is that are found in algae are just a couple of molecules off from being the same as jet fuel and diesel fuel. That's right. So it's a... Uh, it pretty this that's actually one of my areas of interest but uh, we'll go back to the aquaponics thing sorry to steal your thunder there, oh Don. that's all right i'm i'm interested in it anyway so yeah you can you can do all sorts of stuff with aquaponics it's not just growing lettuce um you 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 can feed a family our goal in the next uh, hopefully 4 months or so is that we are eating 10 meals a week our 10 meals a week will consist of breakfast and dinner and that is using our aquaponic system as well as our ducks. And we do have goats for milk as well. Awesome. Well, that's, um, that's pretty interesting. I, I think that in a later episode, we'll have to come up with maybe a planned, um, idea to like what it would take per person or something like that for those that are hardcore and want to go out there and, and uh, completely negate the uh, grocery store. Right. And to do the – if you want to do a survival garden, um, you're going to want to grow your high-protein foods. You're going to want to grow duckweed. Um, you're going to want to grow kale, superfoods. Okay. So tomatoes, you know, other things that – high nutritional value and high nutritional yields. See, I just got this visual of – a tomato flying through the air with a blue cape when he said superfood, but super food. that's because I am very immature. Sorry. Continue. No, that's, that's, a, it's a great point. And you know, that's what I mean about sizing. Um, it really depends on your goal. There is no kit out there that will work for everybody. This is all customization. If your goal is to survive, we can put a fairly small system in and teach you how to survive on it. Now, to do that, again, you don't want to just eat plants and you probably don't want to just eat fish. So we're going to teach you how to integrate, mm -hmm. um, integrate the rabbits, integrate the quail into the system and build that as part of it. If maybe we, we've got a couple of customers that are single moms. They don't want to eat the fish. They put in koi. They want to look at them. They want to feed them. And they want to go out because they're juicers. They spend $450 a month on organic produce for juicing. 
Holy crud. So we looked at that and said, okay, well, what are you buying at the grocery store? And again, a lot of these kales, carrots, some other things. We said, okay, here's a system that we can put in to sub- almost take away that $450 a month. Now, it's not supplementing their entire diet. This is supplementing their juice. Yeah. They're- $450 a month. We had a beautiful custom system put in. Absolutely stunning. And we were looking at a return on investment of about two years because they went with that beautiful of a system with all the custom, you know, brickwork, facades, different things like that. And they're, they're getting $450 worth of produce a month out of this thing most of the year. So you're looking at a very, a very quick return on your investment. And they're extremely happy because now they're organic, non-GMO, no growing to the grocery store and buying dead food. Yeah. They're clipping their food. They're putting it in the blender and they're, in there juicing. That's a, that's an interesting point. You know, Don mentioned that there's, they're not going and buying dead food. It, that's what grocery stores are. It's a morgue. You know, that food that's sitting in there was harvested somewhere else, loaded full of preservatives and brought to, uh, your eating pleasure. Yeah, uh, probably sprayed with pesticides oh, along the way. Sprayed with pesticides and not to, not to get into scare tactics, but there are, Oh yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and scare you. It's what's it's scary. What's on the shelf in the stores? I mean, the the processing plants that handle tuna. Uh, if you get big cans of tuna, that sometimes uh, there will be uh, rodents that'll get caught into the millers and and uh, and the grinders and whatnot, and you find little bits of something fuzzy in there. Well, fish don't have fur, folks. That's uh, right. Anyway, but. The more alive your food is when you eat it, the more energy you're gonna absorb from it. That's I'm not a good saying. Way of saying it. I'm not saying grab a thumper and start gnawing on his ears. You know, you got to dispatch him and cook him up right. But it's going to be better for you if you eat your food within a day of it being dispatched. Yeah, I go out to the garden and pick tomatoes and eat them. Yeah. And Just like apples. That's the only way I enjoy tomatoes. Garden fresh tomatoes have been the only way I've been able to enjoy them. Yeah. So, uh, you know, aquaponics, rabbits, all of it, it it's taking control. That's right. That's what we're offering here is is the chance to learn how to take control of what you eat from seed to meat. Attention marijuana users, potheads, and stoners. We Grow Ours is not dedicated to the growing of yours, quote-unquote. So please disregard any messages here. But if you want to contribute to society, start growing yours, as in your food, as in your munchies, as in just get off the weed. The opinions of Nick Klein on We Grow Ours do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Don Cupper. If you want to grow your own marijuana, feel free, as long as it's legal in your state. 